Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first IFED Night Talk. My name is Andrea Ricci from Florence, but tonight I'm known as Andrea King, as you can see from the belts. The purpose of these interviews is to find out what's behind a great professional, a great team of professionals who is well known in the world stage. Okay. Tonight we have the honor to host uh, Dr. Ron Goldstein and Dr. David Garber from Atlanta in the US. And they are also known as the founders of Team Atlanta and Dental XP. So dear friends, uh, what is your story? How did you end up doing what you're doing now? Well, I was at University of Michigan where I did my undergrad. I was uh, a reporter on the Michigan Daily and I decided I wanted journalism but my dad wanted me to study dentistry. So I spent a summer with him and uh, he said, we need great writers in dentistry. So that's exactly the start of why I became a dentist at the time. And I could work with my dad in practice. So that, that's what's happened. I've written books, articles, all this, and uh, I'm still writing. So, wow. David? And you, David? Me, I was just grossly confused and didn't know what I wanted to do. So I started architecture and then medical and dental school were together. So my whole family were medical. My dad had five brothers, all medical and surgeons and a sister married. So I thought that was an idea but they talked me out of it, but I still wanted to stay in the realm. And then I changed into dental and yes. thought that may be an idea, but there was no great excitement in it. I just thought that may work. I see. I see. And uh, among uh, the activities that you enjoyed the most when you were in the dental school or maybe in the high school or college, what did you have to stop doing in order to become who you are? And uh, in other words, what is the price of your success? Well, in my situation, it had to be, I had to let Judy, my wife, do the raising of our four children. Uh, I would be home as much as I could but she did the job of raising our four kids. And now we've got three dentists and a uh, physician and uh, great grandchildren. So it, it's worked. And uh, I also feel like that the time that we were able to spend uh, with each other, it's, uh, they're my friends. Uh, I don't have a lot of personal friends. So the time it takes for that I put into the office, writing, and doing the other things. David, you, you, look, like, you look like you are thinking. <laughs> I, He's always I'm, thinking. I'm just thinking, <laughs> you know, what, what's the answer? I, mean, I, I think you're getting back to that age-old question that people have often asked me. How do you, how do you find balance in a somewhat chaotic life. And I would say, I don't believe there's any possibility of developing balance. I think what happens is, and when you start off, when you're born and you're a kid, you're number one. That's your single first priority. And as you get older and you acquire relationships and then perhaps children, you're no longer number one. When you're number one on any given day, you could decide I'm going to play squash or I'm going to work or I'm going to really work and do a particular program. And then you find out they have at least similar accountability. And I think things change. I think you then 
evolve where you actually have responsibilities, particularly with children. And responsibilities really overcome. They tip the scales in this process of balance. And so you have to sometimes give up some of the things at the office, some of the programs you wanted to go and do. And I think at any given stage, the answer to it is you as a family have to prioritize together. David. So it's a single, there's no, no one's important. Any decision in this conflict, we need to sit down together. Do we go to the birthday party or do I go lecture in Afghanistan, you know? I have to say that David has the best sense of balance of anyone that I know of. He spent enormous amount of time with, with the kids, his kids, and, uh, and with, with Barbara, his wife. So he, he has a good sense and how he was able to continue to work and get the lectures and the other things he was doing Then work all night, go to sleep around 1 30, 2 o'clock, and uh, get up the next day and start again. That, that's what I tried to do. And when I finished lecturing, I promised Judy that I would spend the time that I would go downstairs in my lecture uh, office and uh, stay with her and uh, watch television programs, and it's changed. But that was only after I quit lecturing. I see. And uh, why do you think uh, uh, this uh, balance is so difficult for dentists to find? Is there something that dentists are missing? They don't have a plan. You know, the best thing I ever did was to join the Junior Chamber of Commerce when I came back to Atlanta from uh, working at the Pentagon. And uh, they taught me how to create a plan of action and how to do this. So I would write everything down and create these plans. They, the average dentist is based on his wife, his companion, and what his obligations are at home. So that's why you have so many dentists that will work, come home, and then go back to work the, the next day. They'll watch television at, at night. They don't have the desire to excel or to teach, or to do other things that take that extra time away from family. So are you saying you had a passion for dentistry? Oh God, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah, I still do, that's why I'm still working. I work two half days a week here. Wow. So, and I'm 88, so. <laughs> wow, what an example you are. And- um, uh, I, Can I interrupt and tell you, I don't believe I had any passion for dentistry specifically. I had a vision of a lifestyle of what I wanted. Mm -hmm. As I told you, I evaluated different options. I kind of looked at my skill set of what I thought I could do. And then when you're looking at a lifestyle, you know money is first and foremost. How much money do you need to earn and then you start to look at the other things you want do you want travel do you want ferraris what will you be wanting and then you find something you can do a trade that will make this lifestyle viable and i think what happens then what happened to me is i got into dentistry i found i was quite good at it uh, then I found I could do it better than most of the people in my class. And I started to really work at it. And as you work at it, you start to get emotional return. 
from doing it beautifully. And then people acknowledge that you're doing it beautifully and you think, you know what? I can do better than this. And I think this is where the term passion suddenly comes in. You're getting so much emotional return that you get passionate, not specifically about dentistry or MODs. I mean, I was passionate about amalgam because I could do amalgam like few people and it, I would sit and carve and play with it. And it, it was an art form and there was an emotive return in doing it. Wow, this is incredible because, you know, I, I feel very much like you. And when, when I talk about dentistry, it, it, it doesn't burn me inside, you know, I don't have a passion. And what I think is that if I, I often think about this, if I would have been an architect, I think I would have got the same results. Do you agree? I mean, what, yes. what you are saying is not only what you're doing, but the way, the attitude that you involve in your profession and also the emotional connection with other things that are uh, allowed to come into your life because of that profession. Do you agree? Correct. I, I would 100%. There's no great love affair. And I believe if I'd done particularly architecture, I would have had the same emotive return in something I found. I mean, I may have been the best designer of toilets anyway. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and I would have enjoyed doing it. And I think we seek to find the return in whatever you're doing. And you would have done anything you did at an extreme level. You would have excelled at it. Yeah. and you would have developed the expertise. There's one tip that I had from an oral surgeon, quite famous, and uh, he took me to lunch uh, in my first year of practice. We were walking out the front door and he saw a uh, umbrella stand. And he said, Ron, I want you to see that umbrella stand. He says, when you walk through the door, you have to leave your problems in that umbrella stand. When you come back in the next morning, you'll pick them up. And that's good advice for, for a dentist because too many of them carry home the problems of that day and they just can't function as well as they should with their spouse, their children, and their other life. I see, I see. Now, uh, let's change a little bit the topic. What do you think about the comfort zone, which is a word that is very common nowadays? I mean, do you know what it is? Because I guess not. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, I, we briefly talked about it. Ronnie wasn't sure what it was. I kind of have my version of what it is. I mean, comfort zone is not dentistry, it's life. I think it's a an arena that you are familiar with and so you feel secure and you feel calm and you feel in control and you feel this because it's familiar because you've been there before or you've done it before and you've done it repetitively so you recognize it. There's just one phrase that I think of in the comfort zone, self-confidence. If you've got self-confidence in your life inside dentistry and outside dentistry, that, that, that's comforting. I think it's a two-edged sword, though, the comfort zone, because when you are repeating things and getting really comfortable with them, it's like first when you first drive, you're paying attention. You're very aware of everything. Now we get in cars and we kind of do it by rote. I think we do dentistry sometimes that way. As you do it, you repetitively, and you get into this comfort zone, you're not paying attention and you're not getting the positive feedback from doing it. And if you're not challenged, 
by wanting to do something different or better, then I think you I think you can stay in the comfort zone for a short while, but after a while you're going to look around, pause, and see what's going on around you. And I think you start to lose the confidence that you're not quite as cool as you thought you were. For sure. I see. And you have to go back out and start, you know, pedaling uphill again. And it's hard. And I think life is like that. Yeah. You're pedaling uphill, you coast downhill for a while, but then you've got to go uphill again. And I think comfort zone is time modulated. There are certain times when you can enjoy it, you should enjoy it, but no, it's an interim phase. Mm -hmm. I see. And, and how important do you think it is uh, a, a, to be able to change, in your opinion? Oh, I think that's essential. Uh, you have to be able to change, not only with the times, but within your own life, your expectations. And the key is setting up goals. When you start out, after five years, you set the next goal and the next goal. That's what drove me to do the things that I've done because each five years, I would set a little bit different goal. 10 years, I wanted to be here. 20 years, I wanted to be here and try to aim toward those goals. That was, that was key for me and it's worked, I think. It obviously has because you're wandering around the office still. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I enjoy everybody here. It's a great team. We've got eight of us, and uh, yeah. I enjoy every, every one of them, plus the staff. We've got 30 people running around here, and I love them as well. It's just a pleasure being here. They are my, my friends uh, because I don't have time for personal uh, okay. friends, except David. <laughs> I see. I see. I, see. Uh, I, th I believe... Somewhere in the questions you asked me, you know, what were the features that allowed me to get to where I am? And I believe adaptability is one of the key factors. Uh, undoubtedly, you have to be adaptable because you do know life changes. I mean, who would have believed we'd be sitting two years into COVID and we had to learn how to deal with it. And we've done things like this for years and years. So you must, you must prepare for these challenges and you must know you must be able to adapt. And then my other thing I believe is endurance. I have staying power. I see. Do you, do you agree that the dentists are reluctant, a little bit reluctant to change, to change protocols? Let's see, for example, digital dentistry, you know, nowadays everybody talks about digital dentistry, but just, I mean, at least uh, here in Europe, just a small percentage are actually switching to digital dentistry. So dentists are probably the, the profession where it is way difficult to change. Why is that? Well, one, it's a question of finance. A lot of dentists do not want to spend for technology. They don't want to spend to do the advancements. I had a friend one time who retired while young. And I said, why do you retire so young? He said, because I wasn't going to spend the money in the practice. And if I couldn't do that and enhance what it, the service for patients, then I felt like I should retire which he did. He was a very good dentist, but he didn't have any of the technology. And we were teaching all of the technology uh, here. I think the first high-tech show in Atlanta was one that we put on. And the uh, first high-tech show in dentistry was what Jack Preston and myself put on in Vegas. So we were always trying to be advanced of what was coming out. And we, we're still doing that with our associates. Our associates are actually leading us. Exactly. <laughs> wow. I mean, way, way beyond us. Yeah. And uh, did you have to change something 
in the recent years in your personal attitude? I think the first thing is my concept has always been to exceed patients' expectations. If a patient says, well, it looks like I thought it would look, that's no good. That, that's a failure. I want the patient to say, good gosh, I didn't think I could get that, or this exceeded what I've expected from you. That, that's what I think is acceptable. But on the other hand, I've aimed for perfection all my life. I consider myself a perfectionist. But one of the things I had to change was understanding there's no such thing as perfection. But if you don't aim toward it, you don't even get close to it. So we have to continue to aim toward uh, what, what we consider is our perfection and goals. I see. David? I mean, I don't think I've changed very much. I'm, I'm fairly constant. Mm -hmm. um, I, do you think I've changed dramatically? No. No. no not at all. And, and what about your personal attitude in your private life? Did you... I mean, the biggest something? thing that happened was obviously COVID because suddenly I was spending more time with my wife in a week than I spent with her in the previous 40 years. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of adapting <laughs> that we each had to do. And, you know, we uh, talking about wives, I think the key to su success for many of us has been the commitment of our wives. I mean, there's no way I that I could have pulled this off without her. I see. And um, one of the things, uh, Andrea, that I changed was I've gone back to painting. Yeah. I mean, I haven't painted in 50 years, but now that I'm not lecturing, I'm writing. And uh, I think that uh, that's given me a lot of relaxation. I see. I see. When my, and my wife lets me do it in the front of the house, a special room. We, we've added to that house seven times yeah. <laughs> because our goal of have, finding a magnificent house is not going to be something that each of us can live with. Judy likes old Victorian and I like modern. So we decide to stay where we are and add, keep adding to the house, which we've done. So we have a, I have a painting room in the front of the house, which is nice. I see. And um, uh, since we all know that it's not easy to collaborate for so many years, especially at the highest level possible as you are. So what is the secret? What is the secret between building the team and partnering with uh, such a high level friend because I'm guess, I guess that you became friends. How is that possible? What are the tricks? Well, since I'm the senior partner here and have had to build it, there were several things that I've recommended that if anyone coming into our practice wants to be successful as part of the team, they have to, one, they have to leave their problems <laughs> like umbrella stand at the front door at night and they have to have a sense of humor i think the other thing is how they communicate that they communicate with patients they need to have a standard of excellence that they want for themselves and for their their patients uh, i think that's most of it I, because you're not looking at the uh, technical abilities at the beginning. Am I correct? No, we assume that who we bring in has got to be state of the art. Okay. They have to have their prosthodontic degree. They have to have all of that. They have to have a base level of information that, that you can develop and hone. And but it, I, I believe if you look at the three of us anyway, Maurice and Ronald and I, I mean, you've got three egocentric 
mild megalomaniacs with very strong viewpoints. And I think we decided that there was enormous potential and committed, and it's a very active process, and not unlike marriage. I mean, you don't just happen to get on, you work to get on. And we are all three complicated people and very different, as you know. But you have to, uh, one of the things that I've had to deal with, uh, with others coming in, is you have to take your ego, which is up here, and bring it down to here. If you want to get along with each other, you have to do that. You, you can't be a superstar by yourself. You have to be a superstar understanding that you've got partners who also have a lot to contribute and you have to compromise. The word is compromise. There's no such thing as you're totally right, I'm totally wrong. And when you can't agree, you have to agree to disagree and move on. And that's what we've had to do. That's how I live with uh, Maurice's idiosyncrasies. He lives with mine. And of course, David doesn't have any. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> that's how we get along. Uh, very funny, very nice, interesting, actually. And uh, if you would have a magic wand, what would you change in your life? Me? I mean, I, at this stage, I would change, I wouldn't change anything, but I'd love to regain my earlier physical prowess, you know, the abilities you had physically. And uh, even mental acuity with time is a much slower process. I mean, I could read journals and retain all the information. I could read books and retain it. Now I, I have to make notes to myself on what's most relevant. And I, always, I always had to take notes myself. <laughs> anyway, and what about you, Ron? Magic one early on would have been to have that great magnificent home. I, I love architecture, so, so does David. So we read home magazines and I see all these great homes that I probably could afford now, but we've added seven times just because we couldn't agree on what was a magnificent home. And I've had to change also the fact that I'm not practicing five days a week, four days, or even three days a week. I'm practicing less. What did I want to do at that time? One, I've always wanted to do a book on photography. Well, I've just completed that. And uh, it's, it's be here in two weeks, finally. But it took three years, really, to do that with, with a great team. And we produced a coffee table book that I'm giving the, all the books to, uh, to Sherilyn Sheets Charity, the National Children's Foundation. And it's for oral health, also for Tomorrow Smiles, which I developed uh, years ago, having dentists around the country, giving back to bully children, children who've teens, not children, but teens, who've dropped out of school because they had a bad smile. And we changed those smiles. We pay for everything. The charity pays for everything but the dentist time. So, uh, so I've, I've fulfilled all of these things in my life, which I'm older than David, 10 years. So at 88, I look back and think, I've done pretty much everything I've wanted to do. I'm very comfortable uh, in, in my life at, at this point. As long as I can paint and, uh, and get along in the kitchen. I'm even chopping up vegetables, helping Judy cook now. <laughs> And she still gets on my back. So that, that's, that's life. <laughs> what was the question now? I'm <laughs> Sorry? Magic wand. Magic wand, no. Magic. You know that, I mean. Yeah. And uh, 
what is your biggest regret? Do you have any? I must say I really don't. I mean, everyone always asks me, would I do it again? I believe I would. I mean, the dentistry has been amazing to me. I mean, I, I look at the relationships, the friendships, the... I've traveled like few people in the world. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Who taught you I that? Mean, Who taught you that? <laughs> brought us into travel, but I, I yeah. traveled. What happens is if we go to Florence, I mean, we go with you to dinner. We see Florence from a whole different perspective. I'm still using the same aftershave that we bought there, which we can now get. I'm still <laughs> drizzling the balsamic on my cheese. Little things that we learned because we were with people who, who were living Florence. We weren't seeing the sights. We were enjoying it. And we've done that all over the world. Very nice. Really incredibly valuable. Very nice. And you I'm are... not writing any more textbooks for dentists. I'm done. I've written enough. And uh, I know David feels the same way. He didn't want to write the ones that we were I in. I didn't want to write the first really ones. <laughs> I had to pester him to death to, to get his manuscripts. And uh, that's always been a problem. But now we've got great associates here. They're part of the team and they're gonna produce great things. So that's the type of legacy that I, I, I leave. I think I, I, I'm very happy with that. Yeah. And uh, I'll be doing less, but I don't have any plans of retiring anytime soon, but they may want me to leave, you know? <laughs> I'm that's sure I'm... Cool about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... Uh, do you let's play a little bit? What is one flaw and one great quality of each other? Let's see. <laughs> well, flaw is easy. When uh, David and, uh, wanted to come to Atlanta, he was practicing with uh, Mort Amsterdam and Arnie Weisskoll and others. And when Arnie called me and said, David wants to move to Atlanta. I said, that's great. He says, but there's only one problem. He has no sense of time. <laughs> and that's one of David's flaws. I don't know, it may be not a flaw, it's a but in the office, it can be. David will be talking to a patient and we have three or four of us waiting outside because we need him elsewhere. He won't stop. He won't stop talking. He'll be, it's the patient is the most important. And, uh, and he's right about that. We treat our patients as a luxury. It's a luxury type of office, but the patient is the most important part of our practice. So that may not be a flaw. His good point, he takes his time to make decisions because he weighs both sides very well and he makes the right decision. So it's, it may take time because it takes time, but we get to a very good place. When we, we, we're all in the office, very different. I'm very much analytical and risk averse. And, and I'm quite happy to go through the process slowly. Good. And what about Ron, David? runs much faster and Maurice can make decisions. I mean, instantly. That falls in the flows or the pros? No. I mean, <laughs> I, I think it's very key. I don't believe I would have been as successful because I would still have been thinking about it. <laughs> I, I'm an enormous mm -hmm. and I'm also a procrastinator. And on top of that, I always, 
I don't get to finish things because I believe I can do it a little better. And Maurice would just tell me, you know, that last version, that's it, we're publishing. And I go, well, there are things we can, uh, you publishing you need to publish now or someone's going to publish because you were talking about it. And Ron, also, I would never have written the books. I mean, he badgered me incessantly. Um, and he can do it, like few people. Do you know how we met? No. Please, tell us. Arnie Weisskogel in Mort Amsterdam's office called me and said, Ron, you're lecturing at the, uh, the San Francisco California Dental Meeting, and we have an associate. It's his first lecture there. And would you just look in and see if you can be of any help to him? I said, fine, I look forward to meeting him. I go into the hotel the first morning and I hear an argument at the front desk. Uh, they didn't have his room, they didn't have this, and he's talking with an accent. So I went over to see what was a problem because my family <laughs> was in the hotel business. Uh, I mean, dentists, but they invested in hotels and built hotels. So I went over to see what it happens and it so happens it was David Garva. So I said, you know what? I called the hotel where I was because I treated the Hyatt people and the manager of the Hyatt uh, in San Francisco was a patient of mine. So I said, can you take care of my friend David? He said, absolutely, bring him over. So we go over and they put him into, I had a penthouse suite and uh, he found a little suite for David, which was almost adjacent to ours. So that's how we met. And so David says, I'm lecturing tomorrow, Ron, would you mind coming in and making a few notes if you find anything that you think I can improve on? Well, I said, fine. So I came there, I made my notes and uh, he never asked after the lecture, what did I think? Finally, it was two days later. He said, by the way, did you make any notes of anything on my lecture? I had three pages <laughs> and full of notes, <laughs> which I thought he could change. David was a great communicator, great educator, but there were things, little things. And you know what? He looked at every one of them, little by little, he adopted most of all the changes. And he became one of the greatest lecturers that I think we've ever had in dentistry. So and that's how we met. I think we all emulate one another. I mean, I don't want to be Ron Goldstein, but the aspects of his that you need to inculcate into the way you deliver or proceed. And many other people you know, that we were fortunate enough to be mentored by. Uh, what was your funniest situation you faced together? Uh, David and I were doing this lecture in the city and we decided to come up with titles because we make our own titles and come up with titles that were funny, but they had double meanings and we start the lecture and our titles go up, nobody laughs. And I said, okay. And then we keep showing and no one's laughing but us. It was the most embarrassing thing because they didn't get the titles and we were hysterical. <laughs> David has to turn and look the other way. <laughs> don't, don't tell jokes in lectures because not everybody understands. Yeah. Never, uh, yeah. never told a joke ever since. I see. I'll tell you another time that David tells me, uh, Ron, I was walking down the hall. He says, Ron, I'm running late on this patient. Please go in the room. I've got a new patient in there and just talk to her a little bit. So I go in and uh, she's leaning back in the chair and I see she's expecting. Uh, so I said, when is the baby due? And she says, I'm not pregnant. So I... <laughs> He's out of the hall, out of the room. And I go down the hall and I said, wait a minute, she's teasing me. So I go back in the room. I said, seriously, when is the baby? 
And she screamed at me, get out, get out. And I think she left the office. She left the office. <laughs> it is funny. <laughs> put, it put it in the mouth. <laughs> okay. So now the last two minutes, I'm going to ask to both of you very quick questions. And I would like you to answer without not thinking too long. Okay. So I will, uh, you just have to reply one or the other. So travel, nature travel versus uh, city travels. Beaches. We both fond of beaches, but love okay. the interest of cities. Okay. Airplane versus train. How do you prefer to travel? Train. Given the option, luxury train. Yes. Okay. Car is a sport car versus an elegant car. What do you prefer? Elegant sport car. My, my Mercedes with the hardtop convertible. And you, David? I like sports cars. I, I, David will know, but before I started dentistry, I was a car mechanic for Lancia and Ferrari. I so see. that's been a favorite. Okay. But right now it's evolved to tech because there's nothing that drives like Tesla. Okay, so you have a Tesla, okay. And uh, do you prefer Apple Watch or classic watch? Classic. Apple. Apple. Brain, you mentioned this, analytical or fantasy, right brain or left brain? Am I right? I mean, I, I'm very analytical. And you, Ron? I make quick decisions. Okay. So, uh, book, do you prefer Kindle or paper book? I love the convenience of a Kindle, but nothing feels like a traditional book. So uh, if it's a good book, I have both. I nice. like paper. I don't like the, the Kindle. Okay. Profession, solo versus team player? Undoubtedly team, having done it both ways. Having... Uh, Having always been a team member, even when I joined my dad in practice, uh, I, I wouldn't want to practice any other way. I see. Okay, so it has, uh, we got to the end. It has been a great pleasure. For me, it was a nice uh, learning experience. And uh, I am honored to have you here tonight. I thank you for your time. And I thank all the people that are following us. And I invite you to follow us even next month at the next IFED Night Talk. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, David, for your time.